And I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My Your love is like the wildest 
Thanks so much for joining us on the hill today. We enter into a time of communion. Just, you know, if you haven't already picked it up, the communion's at the stations around the rooms. It always is. And feel free to pick that up uh, as we enter into a time of communion. Uh, if you brought your offerings you need to give here, the black boxes are here as well. We're just glad you're here to worship. We're glad to see faces again. We're glad to be able to get out and share some freedom. Share some time together and see smiles once again. It's been so awesome to do that over this past week. You know, I once heard it said, sometimes it's not who you are or what you do, but it's who you raise. That struck me pretty deep. It's not who you are or what you do, it's who you raise. You know, think back. Think back to a couple named Mary and Joseph. They had no idea what was coming when they got engaged. And who did they raise? The Savior Lord. Dave's going to talk to you today about David and Goliath. Think about David's parents. They had no idea. They just did their best to raise a child. I think about us and our kids. We just did our best. And I will tell you, it's not who I am or what I've done. It's who I raised. Couldn't be more proud. Today, as we circle the table, we come together to worship together and to worship through a partaking of a cup of juice, a piece of bread, it's the same thing with God our Father. It's who He's raising. It's an army. We shouldn't fear. Sometimes we do. But because Jesus went to a cross, stretched out His arms, willingly died for us, what in the end was it? Rose again. He is our King. He is our God. He is the one that we celebrate, the one that God raised. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for your love, your grace, your mercy. And Father, this morning as, as we just, we circle your table once again and we think about, think about the sacrifice that we were given before we were ever born. so amazing and the sacrifice that continues on for all of us for those of us who have, who have chosen to believe and to walk your path and to struggle every day to be your child and to be the right kind of child Father for those who know you but have not yet decided to follow you and Father for those in the parts of the earth that have no idea who you are yet God forbid that this earth ends before they do this morning, Father, we lift up your son, Jesus. We thank you for his life, his sacrifice, his resurrection. 
God, we can't wait to see him. So, Father, focus us on that this morning as we gather in Jesus' name. shadow that has ever overcome your light there is no rival that could ever stand against your might you've always been with us every battle you've already won we've already won That has ever left a mark on you And there is no army With the power to conquer truth You've always been with us Every battle you've already won You've already won Show me one thing you can't do Show me a mountain he can't move. He's a God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can't pump. He's a God of the breakthrough. And anything is possible. It's possible. There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light, and in his kingdom, every dead thing is bound to rise.
I just wonder, how many of us actually believe that anything is possible? I mean, really believe it. Enough that we would live as if we believed it and act as if we believed it. You know, there, there's been claims that have been made throughout history about things that, that were amazing or possibly unstoppable. The Titanic couldn't sink, but in 1912, it did. In, in 1968, 69, there was no way that the New York Jets could beat the Baltimore Colts in Super Bowl III. But Joe Namath guaranteed it and then backed it up and they did it. I, I mean, as recent as 2015, uh, the Kentucky Wildcats were going to set an all-time record. They were going 40-0 and 0, and they ran into Wisconsin and they lost. The Nazi co code couldn't be broken. Hitler was going to use it to take over the world. But in 1942, it was broken and turned the tide. There was this unstoppable giant that we read about in the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 17 that nobody, nobody had a chance to defeat until a kid showed up. I don't know what brings you out on a, on a kind of rainy, gloomy morning, but I hope it's the worship of a God who specializes in things thought impossible. And so I'm really glad you're here. We're in, this, we're in week two of this series we're calling Heartbeat, and we're looking at the life of this man with the epitaph of a man after God's own heart. And so I hope that you've been kind of mulling over David after last week. Uh, we're glad you're here uh, on campus. If you're joining us online, uh, traveling, whatever, we're glad you're here. But for everybody on campus, online, I want you to get your Bibles out and open up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I, I want you to get in 1 Samuel chapter 17, grab a Bible underneath one of the seats, get it on your phone, that's okay, your tablet, whatever, because I want you to be able to see some things here. And if you are online, I hope you'll ask questions or, or make comments, engage in the comment bar, uh, and, and especially through the summer, we need to remind you if you're traveling, uh, our, our stuff is podcast on all kinds of places. You can listen in the car while you're driving. If you've got questions, see us, we'll hook you up on that. But last week, we started this series, Heartbeat. And we looked at, at, and we said that in each of one of the messages, we were going to look at how David interacted with someone else and what we can learn from that. And so last week we started in, in his calling and we looked at how he interacted with Samuel as Samuel came to anoint him the next king. And in, in this section here in chapter 17, we're going to see this young David start to earn some stripes as a military leader by taking on this giant. Now, here's what I don't think about this particular scripture. I don't think that God chose to include this particular story and this particular scripture to help prepare you and I to fight men that are over nine feet tall. I'm going to go out on a limb and say chances are none of us have ever or will ever meet a dude that's over nine feet tall. I'm going to say that that's not why it's in here. I really think then it's in here for much bigger reasons. In, in fact, I'll go as far as not only will we not see any guy nine feet, I'm going to bet, I may be wrong, but I'll go out on a limb and say, probably none of you know anybody named Goliath. Now, you might know a dog named Goliath 
or a bull. You know, people tend to name really big animals Goliath. But I don't know any mom that, you know, when little one was born, she looked at him, let's call him Goliath. There, there's not great connotations attached to that name. But I'll bet you this, too. In fact, I'll guarantee you this, that every one of us in here has a Goliath in our life. Maybe multiple Goliaths. Maybe multiple Goliaths. Because see, a Goliath is any problem or challenge or obstacle or worry or sin that's standing between you and God. Your personal giant is standing in the way of where you are and where you know that God wants you to be and to go. And so I think this story of the heartbeat of David is critical for us because we all, all of us, have things that we're facing in this life that are bigger than us. Goliath was bigger than David. But catch this, because you've got to understand this, God was bigger than Goliath. That's a truth that we can take into our own life, that whatever our Goliath is, it might seem bigger than us, but God's bigger than our Goliath. You've heard the old saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. We know that. Here, let me suggest this concept to you, okay? The bigger your God, the smaller your Goliath. In fact, we'll come back to that a lot. Today. That's our bottom line today. Now, I'm not saying that we all have different gods. That's not what I'm saying in that statement. I'm not saying that my God is in any way bigger than your God. There is only one God, and he is bigger than the universe. But as your here, as your view of God, as your understanding of God, as your trust in God grows, the Goliaths in your life will tend to shrink. Remember the old movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? <laughs> Let's just play that out and let God say, Honey, I, I shrunk your Goliath. I shrunk your Goliath. So let's look at the Bible to get the setting, okay? In the early part of, of chapter 17 there, you, you get the setting. Chapter 16 was when David was anointed as, as the king, as the king that would replace Saul. And in the beginning of chapter 17, there's this, there's this stalemate. You got the Philistine army that's gathered on a hillside overlooking the valley of Elah. All right, so you've got this army up here on the hillside, and then you've got this valley, and then over on the other hillside is the Israelite army, and, and they're kind of stuck in a stalemate. They're both, you know, like, they're both up on the hillside. Nobody, no armies are really ready to charge the battle, uh, to charge the valley, and then one day, one day a representative actually a very large representative of the Philistine army, decides to come out and make this one-on-one, -on -one, mono -e mono challenge. And it tells, that, tells me that most of the Philistines, here, you think about it, they're up here on the, on the hillside. They've just been up there for a few days. And none of them, none of them are coming down. It, it kind of tells me that the, the general population of the Philistine army was just as worried about battle as the Israelite army. The difference was, the difference maker was, the, the, the Philistines, the Philistines had a trump card. They had the big brother, you, you know, that you call on when you get in trouble in school and you want big brother to come and take it. They had the enforcer, the neighborhood bully. So Goliath steps out walks down partway down the hill and offers this mono e mono challenge. It's pretty simple. Send somebody, we'll fight mono e mono to the death. And the loser's army becomes slaves of the winning army. I've never seen somebody nine feet tall. I've got some good friends that are seven feet tall. But I've never seen anybody nine feet tall, actually more than that. But I've had some giants. In fact, I got a few giants right now in my life that if, if, if I allow them to, will come out on the hillside across from me and make challenges to try to deter 
my moving forward. I, I, I'm guessing that some people that are here this morning have some of those same giants. So into that environment, the man after God's own heart quickly develops a plan and steps into battle. And so that's what I want us to look at as we walk through chapter 17. I want us to see David's plan and see how we can make it our plan as we face whatever giants we have in our life. The very first thing started, and it was somewhat simple for David, and to begin this battle that we have to engage in in life, we have to identify the enemy. We have to identify the enemy. We've all got giants that we aren't willing to deal with. You know what we tell you, the, the kind of the, the terminology sometimes we use, there's an elephant in the room. You ever been in one of those meetings? <laughs> you're, you're, in the, you're, you're there together and there's this like elephant in the room that nobody's willing to deal with. You know what I'm talking about. It's like everybody knows that this or that or whatever, but nobody's willing to deal with it. There's this elephant in the room. There's this giant elephant in the room. But we all know, don't we? What's the best way to eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You, you got to identify the elephant in the room. You'll never attack it or eat it if you don't identify it. And lots of people today, maybe some of you guys came here today and you never thought of it in this terms, but there's a lot of people that have these giant elephants in the room of their life and everyone else sees the elephant except them. Everyone else sees it, and they're in denial. They think, I'm okay. It's no big problem. There's a lot of giants in our world. It, 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 but we think, I don't have any giants in my life. We ignore the addiction, thinking that maybe it'll go away. We pretend that the abuse never happened. Maybe, maybe he won't ever do it again. We, we want to think that if we stuff the worry and the depression way down deep in the cushions of our life, that no one will ever know. So what's your giant? Because if we're going to battle, if we're going to win, we've got to be able to identify the giants that are in our life. Now, Goliath, let's get back to the text here. Goliath is pretty easy to identify. I, I mean, he's over nine feet tall. Actually, if in, the, in the Hebrew writing of this text, the, the terms that are used of cubits and spades, it would actually equal nine feet nine inches. That's how tall Goliath was. Nine feet, nine inches. I'm a little over 6'2 with my shoes on, so add another third to me. The, the, tallest, the tallest man that's ever lived, been recorded to live in modern day history, was a guy named Robert Wadlow. Check out this picture of, of Mr. Wadlow. He was born in Illinois in 1918. He stood 8 feet 11 inches tall. That means that Goliath was almost a foot taller than this guy. He's easy to identify. Not only is he tall, he's big. He's big and he's strong. His armor that he wore into battle weighed over 200 pounds. His armor would have outweighed David considerably just by itself. The spear that he carried, the head of the spear, the Bible tells us this, the head of the spear weighed 15 pounds. I don't know if you've ever done anything and done any just little weightlifting. Oh, a 15-pound dumbbell is pretty easy to lift off the ground. You start curling it a few times, it'll get to it. Imagine throwing it on the end of a spear. And that's what Goliath was able to do. And so I want you to look at verse 10, at what Goliath starts off with. In verse 10, he says, this day, this day, I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. I defy you. I defy the Israelite army. I defy the army of God. Then verse 11 shows us how the Israelites responded. Upon hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. 
So that was the daily morning occurrence. The Bible tells us it went on for 40 days. It's, it's interesting how many times, especially in the Old Testament, how many things went on for 40 days? For 40 days. And then after 40 days, David, who would, last week, if you remember, if you tracked with us last week, remember the thing we talked about David was how faithful he was, and that when his father told him to do something, he just immediately responded. So David has this moment when his father tells him, Jesse tells him, go take this food down to the battle. Just go drop this food off. David was like the original DoorDash driver, all right? He's just going to take this food down to the battle, drop it off, head back home, take care of the sheep. But he gets down there, and, and he, the, the brothers, none, not only his brother, nobody's in battle. They're just kind of all up there hiding in the mountain. And he's like, what's up with this? And here's your food or whatever. And he, he kind of probably turns to leave, and that's when Goliath comes out and starts yelling. And David hears the yelling. And, and David hears the trash talk. And David hears him slamming the, the army, but he also hears him slamming God. And Goliath was not only holding the Israelite army at bay, he defied not only the army, but God. And that's what got the attention of a man with God's heartbeat in him. I can just imagine David just doing this double take like, what? Are you kidding me? And then looking at it, what are you guys doing? No, don't let him do that. Now, your Goliath is not nine feet tall. We've already established that. He's not nine feet, nine inches tall. He's probably not even seven feet tall. He's probably not even four feet tall because it's just the attitudes. Now, maybe it's an obnoxious boss. Maybe it's an alcoholic spouse. Maybe it's a rebellious teenager. Maybe your Goliath is a failing grade or failing health or failing marriage. Maybe it's a bad habit or a secret sin or an addiction or a bad attitude. Maybe your Goliath is worry or depression or, or guilt or gossip or pride. But we've got to identify it and figure out what's your Goliath. What's the biggest giant that you're facing right now? And here's a truth that you can hang on to. You can't fix it until you face it. You can't fight it until you identify it. Or you'll be just like that, that person that's swinging aimlessly in the dark and doesn't even know what the enemy looks like. And Satan specializes in that. He's a deceiver. He wants to hide himself. He wants to hide the giants. He wants to, to let them be there, but not let you know what they are, because if you know what they are, you identify them. You might be able to turn it over to God and gain victory. So we've got to identify what the giant is. The second thing David did was, <laughs> you just got to ignore the skeptics. <laughs> you got to ignore the non-believers. David hears this smack talk. He can't figure out why nobody is doing anything. And so he starts to ask questions. Skip down to verse 28. David has been asking all these questions. Why aren't you guys doing anything? Who's going to step out? And Eliab, who's David's oldest brother, steps out. He hears him. He hears him speaking with the other men. And he burned with anger, the Bible says. He burned with anger at David and asked him, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you lead those few little sheep in the desert? Notice the dig there. Notice the dig he's getting there. It's like, you just, you're just a shepherd boy. What are you even doing? That? Oh, and by the way, who's got your sheep? Who's taking care of the lambs? And, he, and then he goes back and he comes hard now. He says, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. I don't know about you, but Eliab seems a little touchy to me. It, it, it maybe he's still a little ticked off that he didn't get anointed king. And, and so he adds to that and challenges David. But to his complaint, there is no battle to watch. <laughs> you know, the, the, the smart aleck in me would have said, big brother said, you just came down here to watch our battle. I might have said, yeah, that's why I'm here. So what are you doing up here? There ain't no battle. 
You're not doing it. That, not doing anything. Why would it be conceited to watch maybe little brother, maybe I'm looking at my big brothers and I'm looking at you guys to step up and do something huge and you're hiding. And David wasn't even talking to Eliab in the first place because it says that Eliab came up and heard him speaking with the other men. And so David just goes back to asking more questions. Look at verse 32. David then says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. I got this. I, I'll, I'll go. And Saul replies, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're just a boy. And th does that dig? Uh, come on, men, guys, listen. Guys in the room, listen to me. When you were growing up, did anybody ever push you to the side and say, you can't do that, you're just a kid? Let a man do this. Let a man step up and do this. Once again, once again, you know, smart aleck in me might have said, all right, I'll step back, go do something. Let a man handle it, go do something. But nobody was doing anything. And Saul says, he's been fighting. He's been a fighting man since, since he was a youth. See, here's what we got to understand. We got to be able to identify our giants. But understand this, anytime, anytime, anytime you step out to conquer a giant, you're going to face skeptics and critics who would rather tell you you're stupid for even trying to do something significant because it points out their unwillingness to do anything. And so they'll tell you you can't do it. It'll never work. So we need to identify our giants. We need to kind of ignore our skeptics. And there needs to be at least a moment where we remember our victories. Where we remember our victories. When Eliab and then Saul challenged David, he immediately reminds him, hey guys, this isn't my first rodeo. This isn't my first fight with God in my corner. Look at verse 37. The Lord who delivered me, I've already been there, been there, we've been in battle, and the Lord delivered me from the paw of the giant and the paw of the bear. That same God will deliver me from this Philistine. David defends his ability, but notice what he does. He's really quick to give credit to who? He's really quick to give the glory to God. The Lord did this. God delivered me then, and he will do it again. Remember what he said, what we said earlier? The bigger your God, the bigger your view, the bigger your understanding, the bigger your trust, the bigger your God, the smaller your Goliath. David knew that he served a big, big God. And so one of the things that you may need to do right now is take a 30-second pause and remember the things that God's already brought you through. Remember the battles you've already been in in your life, however long that might be. Remember the times when you knew you were in a mess, you knew you were in a fix, and you didn't, and God stepped in, and there was victory. And, and so you can identify the giant, you begin ignoring the skeptics. One of the ways that you do that is by remembering your victories, remembering what God's done, and then fourthly, focus on your strength. Focus on your strengths. Once they realized, once everybody realized, this kid's serious. He's going in. Well, well Saul tries to save a little face by saying, well, if you're going to go, <laughs> if you're going to go, here, at least put my armor on. At least take my weaponry. At least take all the things that I already have in my toolbox to protect me that I'm not willing to use. But if you're going in, here, at least take this because he's thinking in his mind, at least when David gets killed, nobody will say, I didn't do anything because he'll die with my armor on. He'll die with my armor on. David actually tries it on. It's a miserable fit. It, 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 it's like the, the, the short skinny guy trying to put on a 52 long suit jacket. It, it ain't going to work. You can't, you can't move. He couldn't move. He couldn't fight. It just wasn't for him. He decided to go with what he was good at. And so he slips out and heads down the stream. He heads out to find a couple 
stones. Because he knew, he knew that sling that he had tucked into his belt. He knew he could clip the wings off a mosquito at 50 yards because he had practiced. He had some skills. He had some gifts. And, and, and so off to the battle, he goes with that sling. He stops and grabs these five stones, and he enters the battle zone, focusing on his strengths. See, you, you've, you've got some giants. We all do. But you've got some strengths, too. Every one of us has certain gifts and abilities. And God has a way of using our abilities and strengths to help us defeat our giants. When people come after us, when people criticize us, when people kind of say all kinds of things, and all we're trying to do is do the work of the Lord, we just got to buckle up with our strengths. The fifth thing David did, and here's, this is, I think this is the most powerful part, most powerful part of the story. Because we kind of know, I mean, every, if this was your first day in church, but you've grown up in America, the chances are really, really high that you know how the David-Goliath battle ends. I mean, that, that just kind of gets portrayed everywhere. But I want you to see this, I think this next part is the best part and the most powerful part of the story because it's in this part of the story that we see David trust God. Because if we're going into battle, that's what we've got to do. See, it's about to get real. He's going in. David's brothers are kind of thinking, Goliath, he's, he's too big to swing at. He's too big to hit. And David goes in thinking, are you kidding me? He's too big to miss. And so he starts into the battlefield, and Goliath is furious. Look down at verse 43 of your text. Look at Goliath's response. Are you kidding me? Am I a dog? that you come at me with sticks, the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And he says to him in verse 44, come here, come here, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Malcolm Gladwell has written a book called David and Goliath, and the underscore is underdogs, misfits, and the art of battling giants. And in that book, he tells us that everyone has weaknesses, and one of the weaknesses of, of, of giant people is some of their senses aren't great, and typically they don't see very well. So Goliath is like, come here, boy, so I can see you, and then I'm going to deal with you. And so David just keeps coming. Then here's the part. Do not miss this. If you're a highlighter, an underliner, verses 45 through 47 are the most important things to highlight. Don't worry about highlighting and underlining David killed Goliath. We know that's coming. Look at verse 45. David says to Goliath, says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. The whole world will know. Underline that. And all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord says, for the battle belongs to the Lord, and he will give all of you. Notice, David's not even just stopping at Goliath now. He's kind of shouting at all the army. He said, all you guys are going down today. This man with the heartbeat of God knew that it wasn't his battle. He knew the battlefield belonged to the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> What's your giant? What's your giant? When you go into battle, what's your giant? What do you do? What do you do when your college professor ridicules your faith? What do you do when the doctor says there's no hope? What do you do when you've been going along pretty good, but you fall off the wagon and slip back into addiction? What do you do when Satan comes to you in that, in that voice in your ear and says, just once won't hurt? What do you do when the boss on Monday says, if you don't lie for the company, you're going to lose your job? Do you roll over in defeat? Do you give up? Do you give in? 
In his book, uh, In the Pit with a Lion, Mark Batterson said, we should stop asking God to get us out of difficult circumstances and start asking him what he wants us to get out of those difficult circumstances. What do you want me to learn here, God? And trust God. Identify our giant. Ignore the skeptics. Trust God. And then verse 48 here, it's, it comes a time when you just got to charge the storm. You got to initiate the battle. Let me be very clear here. You don't, let me, this is important because sometimes we lose sight of what the real giant, what the real battle is. You don't, you don't have to accept the invitation to every argument you're invited to, right? <laughs> Sometimes you can just walk away, but you don't have to stand back and say nothing, especially when the God you worship is being defied. And so look at verse 48. The Philistine moved close to attack him. Here comes Goliath. And what does David do? David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Remember, some of you that have been around a while, remember a few years ago I told you the story about the buffaloes in Colorado? When they see the storm coming, they see the big storm clouds and the, and the, and the storm wall coming toward them on the prairie. Remember what I told you the buffaloes do? Their natural instinct is not to run from the storm because instinctively they know if they run from the storm, the storm will catch them and it will go with them and they will be in the eye of the storm much longer. No, the buffaloes know good and well. When they see the storm coming, they charge the storm and run straight through it to the other side where there's safety. And David, when he saw Goliath coming, instead of running back to the army, he charged the storm. He charged the storm. Hurricane Goliath was brewing, and David charged the storm. So whatever your Goliath is, maybe it's time to charge the storm. And then the stone flies. We know that part, right? It, it, when, when Kevin, at the beginning of the service, said, Dave's going to talk to you about David and Goliath, everyone in here knew there was a sling and stones, right? That didn't, that didn't catch anybody off guard. You didn't sit there thinking, I wonder what part's going to, you know, we knew that. And the sling, and, and I just see this, like this, this kid, and I see this sling going around, and I see him charging the giant, and I see the, the stone flying through the air, and Scripture tells us the stone hit square, and Goliath was down and can you imagine that moment can you imagine that moment everyone's stunned the, the israelite army is like oh my he did it he really did it the philistine army is terrified and they're all just kind of there with this, this kind of like silent totally silent, you know, wonder and anticipation. Is he going to get back up? And when he gets back up, is he really, really, really going to be mad and really, really come after David? <clears throat> and so David does what he promised he was going to do. David runs over to Goliath. And you know, did you notice when he was telling Goliath what he was going to do? Did you notice what he said in Scripture? Did you notice he said, today I'm going to knock you down and I'm going to cut off your head? Did you notice that in Scripture? But all he had was a, all he had was a sling. How's he going to do that? And so he runs over to Goliath and gets Goliath's sword. It's not big enough that I'm going to take you down. I'm going to cut off your head. I'm going to do it with your sword. Just prove it. And so David takes this, this little kid, and this is nothing. This is pretty cool. But this is nothing compared to the sword that Goliath would have had. And so you've got this young kid just rearing back and boom. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. And when the battle belongs to the Lord, he's going to provide the weapons that you need to win the battle. And sometime the weapon that you need to win the battle might be on the hip of the enemy. 
and he will defeat the enemy. He will come. And so David told Goliath he's going to cut off his head. He comes and he, and he cuts off the Goliath's head. And in this final section of the story, I love this part of it. It's so cool. Some might say it's gruesome, but it's in the Bible, so it's cool. Not only does he cut off his head, what does he do? That kid grabs the hair of Goliath and holds his head up high so everybody can see we don't have to worry about this anymore. And with that, the Israelite army came flying down the mountain. The Philistine army was wiped out and God had won the victory just like David said he was going to do. And guys, here's what we got to take away from this today. We ain't fighting no nine foot giants. We're probably not going to single-handedly go into battle against a military army. But when you slay your giant, you give those that are watching you the courage to charge. And the Israelite army came flying down the mountain, ready to go. So here we go again. What's your giant? There's something in your life right now that's so big that you just need to cut off the head. That you just need to cut off the head. And then when you cut it off, you don't need to leave it laying there. You need to pick it up so that everyone else that's struggling in their marriage can see that you cut off that demon that was trying to destroy you and that maybe there's hope. That you can see that everyone that's battling cancer can see that you took it on head on and you gave all glory to God. That whatever addiction it is and it gets a hold of you for a little bit and you conquer it, you need to hold it up so that those that are still battling know that there's victory in the name of the Lord. Because the more God becomes real in your life, the bigger your view the more your understanding, the greater your trust, the bigger your God, the smaller your Goliath. And the heartbeat of God is to give the battle over to him and go slay some giants. Would you guys stand up with me? Kevin, Deanne, the band are going to lead us in a, in a worship song. Jason's going to be down here. Bradley's in the room. Bobby's in the room. If, if you need to talk to someone or you just need to pray, God, this is my giant. That's what I want us to do more than anything else right now. I want every one of us right now to identify a giant in our life and get ready for battle. And, and I, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's the biggest giant in your life right now. You need to plug into the power source because the battle already belongs to him and you're wearing yourself out fighting it alone. You need to surrender. And so while we sing, let's just make this a worship time where we deal with some giants.
say, look, you don't have to worry about him anymore. That's what God wants to do. He wants to come back. He wants to be able to assure you, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You don't have to worry about that because there is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who have found their living hope in Christ Jesus. That's why we come together to worship. 
And I'm glad you guys are here today. If this is your first time, man, thanks for coming and joining us. Uh, out in the lobby, the I'm New Wall, Big Orange Wall, Brett and his team have got a gift for you out there. They love to greet you and welcome you. If you've been trying to figure out what do I do next or you're interested in Pathways, which is our on-ramp uh, to, to salvation and to membership, to discipleship, to involvement, all those things, the next Pathways is June 22nd. In the Next Step room back there, there's a team of people that can tell you more about that, help you get signed up. And if you haven't joined us yet, it's not too late. We're reading through the entire New Testament this summer. There are cards up here on the end of the stage and on all the little uh, tables out in the lobby. Uh, today's June 6th, so we're on day 6. Uh, and so we'll read chapters uh, 16, 17, and 18 uh, in Matthew today uh, and keep moving through that uh, for the summer. And so, man, I want you guys to get involved in that journey. Thanks for being here. Get out of here. Go love God and love people. And let's go change the world.